Hello, Hopkinton, and welcome to Wednesday 27th here at HCAM TV and the Hopkinton Hangout Hour. I'm your host, Jim Cousins. Along with me is Bob Hamilton, making everything work in the background, and we're really glad that you're able to join us. I know there's snow on the ground, but it's still a very important time for Hopkinton Little League. And so we're very excited to have some representatives from there on our show to talk to, uh, to talk with us and share with you what's happening and maybe a little bit of history uh, of their organization. So welcome to Georgia, Claire and Jeffrey. Glad you could be here. Thank you Thank so you much, much for having us. Yeah, all right. Appreciate now, it. First thing, just in case somebody doesn't know, can we just go down the line and, and introduce yourself and say what you do with the organization? And let's start with Georgia. Sure, this is Georgia Hall, and um, I am the player agent and the equipment manager for Hopkinson Little League, and I've been involved with the board for about four or five years right now, um, and have um, also been coaching over um, the last few years, also both softball and baseball. Okay. Thank you. Claire. I'm the secretary of Hopkinton Little League. I've been on the board for about um, three years now and just recently took over the reins of secretary. And um, I'm a longtime parent. I've had three boys play in the league and um, um, have uh, enjoyed it from a parent volunteer standpoint for many years and decided that it was time to, to help out on a higher level. So um, thank you so much for having us. Oh, that's awesome. Thanks. And uh, Jeffrey, hi. Hi, uh, Jeff Streak here. I'm the president for Hopkinson Little League. Um, I've been a volunteer for, gosh, I guess about six years now, um, both as a coach and then just prior uh, board uh, roles. Okay, great. So let's start with the beginning as far back as any of you can go and tell us... Um, what you can about the organization, about, you know, um, if you know how long it's been going on, you mentioned a little bit uh, about some of your involvement. I'd like to just hear a little bit of um, what you do and how long you, you may know that they've been doing it. Anybody? Uh, sure, <laughs> so I can, I can start, um, so, Gosh, you know, you, you've stumped me. I don't know actually when we uh, started uh, Hopkinson Little League. Um, you know, it's been a part of the town for quite some time. Uh, you know, I've been here in town for about 15 years now. So I know that, you know, the program has been uh, um, up and running uh, for that amount of time. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of just broad stroke program type things, uh, we're uh, strictly uh, volunteer driven. Um, nonprofit organization. Uh, we're affiliated with uh, Little League International. Uh, we offer both uh, baseball, softball, and then a new program we're launching this year called Challenger. Um, we have approximately uh, 30 uh, board members that occupy different roles um, within the organization. And in terms of volunteers, uh, we average uh, around 130 uh, to 200, depending on the type of season we have. Um, other facets of our program include uh, our umpires, uh, which uh, we really try to uh, use kids that have been in the program before, um, or those that are, you know, alumni, might be in high school level that want to make umpiring uh, kind of a more full-time thing. Uh, so we're proud to have them be a part of the program still. Um, and then we also have uh, volunteers that run our concession stands um, as well. So we're trying to give back to the community, um, you know, for, for the kids that have been a part of the program, still have an opportunity to be affiliated with uh, Hopkinton Little League. So Jeff, 130 volunteers, that is a lot of volunteers. Does that include the players? Does not include the players. Um, from a player point of view, uh, in the in what I'll call our, our you know typical best season, which is you know not last year, not this year. Uh, so pre-COVID, we, we would have a little over 600 uh, players uh, involved in the program. Um, 
And we are in, uh, Little League is comprised of districts. Uh, we're in what they call District 11. And we're, we're the largest program within that district. Um, and it includes some, some large towns, uh, Canton, Norwood. Um, so we, we actually do uh, a pretty comprehensive program uh, across the board. Um, is that 600 Hopkinton kids? It is. Um, uh, the majority are Hopkinton uh, with the new program uh, that we're launching um, this year officially. Uh, the Challenger program. We're actually opening that up to uh, any town with with uh, you know that wants to, to join us. Um, so you know, Southboro, Northboro, Holliston, whatever. Um, you know, we're okay. open to to those players. Wow, that's really. I had no idea you were that big. That's very impressive. Jim, can I just add one one thought in there? George, please do. <laughs> And that is uh, a couple of things. One is that, you know, the, the institution of Little League is, is uh, you know, itself um, very old and obviously a huge tradition um, in this country and goes back to the 1930s or so in terms of officially being organized. And we, we actually have uh, coaches right now who grew up as players um, in Hopkinton Little League. And so, you know, the, the um, you know, the uh, loyalty to the program and the history for many individuals coming up and learning softball, learning the game of baseball through this program. And then if they happen to remain in Hopkinton, being able to, to stay with it as coaches and work with young people themselves, um, you know, is a, just a really nice part of the story, I think, of Hopkinton Little League. That is really good. Now, Georgia, with what Jeff was just saying about opening up um, membership to surrounding towns as well if they wish to be involved. Would that also open it up for uh, people who grew up playing in Hopkinton but then maybe moved out of town? Could they then still be an active volunteer? Well, I mean, I think that, that this challenger opportunity certainly, um, as it reaches out into other communities, could could uh, you know invite those sort of connections, but I think that there are also on occasionally there are folks who who are from you know outside of having their own kids play. I mean we have a number of board members now whose children have actually aged out of playing, yep. but uh, but board members you know remain loyal to the organization. It's important for them to see uh, little league continuing to take place in the town and wanting to give back and, and have a role to, to help that keep going. So, I mean, I, I, I think it's certainly possible that sometimes there might be members who move out of town, but stay connected to the program. Mm -hmm. um, Jeff, I'm wondering if you have 600 students, a student, sorry, if you have 600 <laughs> players from Hopkinton, why would you open it up to other towns? What, what's the, what is the thinking there? Yeah, so it's probably worth uh, giving you a little context on what the Challenger program is. So uh, the Challenger program was created by Little League International for uh, special needs kids uh, to give them an opportunity to participate um, in game uh, like activities, learn about the game and, and just overall have fun. Um, there's similar programs in, in other sports, uh, basketball, soccer uh, within town. And uh, those programs are also open up to, you know, surrounding communities to, to participate. And uh, we, you know, with our starting challenger, um, we're kind of uniquely, you know, positioned, if you want to call it that, to uh, kind of cater to Metro West. Um, there's, I don't know of another program that's kind of around us that, that's um, offering baseball at the moment. And we saw it as a great opportunity uh, to offer something to those players um, and their families um, that want to play. Uh, it's fully sponsored, uh, which means that uh, similar to basketball and uh, some of the other programs uh, for those players, uh, it's free uh, for them to play. And it's a really cool program. I'm really excited to launch it um, this season. Uh, it also provides abilities for uh, our 12 year old players or alumni players or anyone who wants to volunteer say at from the middle school or high school level to be buddies um, of those players. There's a, what they term a buddy program and uh, volunteers are paired up with uh, challenger players. They are with them from the moment they step on the field to the moment they step off. 
Um, and it's just, it's a great kind of opportunity for families to watch their players play um, mm. and, and participate if they want, or just sit back and, and watch and enjoy. Right. Now, um, I'm interested in uh, the Challenger program. Is that something that came about through the Hockington Little League or through this district that you're a part of? Or is it, is it a program that was designed from, I believe you said, uh, Little League International? Um, what's the genesis of that? And how did, how did you bring it to Hopkinton? So Little League International um, has, has facilitated this division. Um, and, uh, you know, our district currently has two other towns that have challenger programs. They're not close by. Um, Canton is one of them. And it, it just seemed like a great opportunity for us to offer something in our area um, similar to other sports that, that do the same. Um, and uh, at least for me, it, it felt like a win-win for, for everyone in the community, uh, for us to be able to give back and for you know, new players that don't have the opportunity to play baseball or softball uh, to, to give them that opportunity. Awesome. Now, who can tell me about, um, you said it's fully sponsored. Who can talk about uh, what sponsorship looks like for the Challenger program? or even if there's sponsorships for Little League in general? Yeah, so because we're um, you know, strictly non nonprofit, we, we rely on sponsors to, to help uh, drive aspects of our program. Um, and we were fortunate enough to, uh, first of all, we have uh, two great volunteers that, that drive our sponsorship efforts. Um, they reach out to uh, both local businesses, um, businesses in the surrounding area, uh, we even have uh, folks uh, like myself, um, I work for a large company in the area and they, uh, in a way, have programs designed to um, uh, uh, give volunteer uh, type money or funds to uh, a program like Hockey in the League. So uh, it's a pretty diverse program. Um, it's great that we're able to cater to uh, a lot of the, the uh, businesses in town um, who want to continually be affiliated with us. And uh, um, yeah, it's just a great, great mm. uh, chance to give back that way too. Okay. So uh, Claire, I've, I've been having these numbers run through my head now, uh, 130 volunteers and 600 players. And you're the secretary, right? Yes. So tell me about what being the secretary of this organization is like. Well, it involves a lot of communication, you know, with all these volunteers and even just 30 members on the board, there's a lot of communication that needs to, to happen. So that's a, one of my primary roles is, is to make sure that um, we're all talking to each other and, and everything's getting ready on time and on pace for getting the season together. And um, you, you now have a feel for what 600, 700 players, I don't know if you've ever seen um, the Little League Parade but 600 and yeah. 700 players it takes quite a while to walk from the Hopkinton Common uh, all the way to Carrigan Field. And yeah. it's, a, it's a lot of fun to see all those kids in their uniforms. Right, right. So um, is there a lot of paperwork? Are you a 501C? Yes, we are. Okay. Yep. All right. And um, are all the members and the volunteers parents or former players that have a connection to the game? I would say the majority are um, um, mostly parents and, um, and there might be the occasional um, brother or sister who helps out at practices, but it's mostly parents and our, our current players in our program. Um, we have, you know, a lot of coaches. Um, we have a lot of parent volunteers that um, do things like, um, setting up the snack schedule or just helping the coaches coordinate the teams or uh, just uh, the little kids, just uh, making sure that they uh, are staying focused and, and energized and engaged in the game. So you have a lot of needs for volunteers. Um, if somebody's handy with a shovel or a rake, uh, they can help with the fields. Um, you know, it's, it, as uh, Jeff said, we're a, a totally volunteer run organization and um, and we take care of all of our fields uh, in town other than the ones owned by the schools. So it's quite an undertaking um, th that in order to bring it all together. Right, right. It does sound like a lot. And it's interesting. You know, you go ahead, Georgia. Yeah, if I, if I can add on to that. I mean, one of the things I think to pull out of um, 
you know, what, what Claire is saying is that, um, that there's so many different roles to play and no experience necessary. Um, and, and that goes for coaching too. Like we really uh, encourage folks to consider taking on a coaching role um, within the, the organization. And it doesn't, it really, it doesn't require previous coaching experience and it doesn't really require a huge amount of necessary skill around softball or baseball, but just really the willingness to go out there and stay two pages ahead of the kids, you know, in any sort of uh, manual or drills or things like that. Um, but it's really about, it, it's really about sharing the joy of a game and, and, you can be co-learning that game also, but we really encourage people to, to think about the opportunities to coach, um, which it's not a huge time requirement. I mean, usually teams practice for an hour, maybe one week, weekday, weeknight, um, an hour, an hour and a half, and then the same thing on a weekend. So you're, you're really talking about a three or so four hour commitment um, each week and that's it. And it's uh, hopefully lovely weather days and you get an opportunity for some physical activity also. So it's really a win-win and we rely on folks stepping up as volunteers to, to help out with the coaching. And um, I think for people, it's, um, it's, it's a wonderful experience and uh, you can always start out as an assistant coach and then move to a head coaching position as you become more confident and comfortable with it. But we have lots of opportunities for people to explore those roles. Okay, so a uh, few hours a week, three to four hours a week. Mm -hmm. How long is the season and how many games do you typically play? So we typically start uh, uh, around April, April 1st with our, and that's totally weather dependent because sometimes, as you know, the April showers mm -hmm. have brought very muddy fields and yeah. enormous puddles, but hopefully that's when our season starts. And uh, then we, four or so weeks later, three weeks later, we start to get into our game season in addition to our practice season. And that takes us right on up to the end of school, usually. And we transition actually into a, a summer season um, with a whole new set of teams and opportunities for kids to play. So, um, you know, it's, it, it goes really quickly, actually. And we go through some pretty interesting weather changes uh, when you play spring ball in New England. But, uh, but it's, a lot of, it's a lot of fun and uh, a wonderfully engaging, uh, rewarding experience to, to work as a coach. So I was just a little unclear. Does the season end when school ends or does something else happen when- Yeah, typically the, the spring season ends okay. when school ends, but then we transition to offer a whole nother summer season after that. And that usually goes right through half of June and right through the month of July. And summer ball usually winds up sometimes around, you know, sometime around July 20th, 25th, something like that. So okay. it's pretty, you know, it's a lot of opportunity, pretty packed, a lot of opportunity for coaching and playing. Mm -hmm. Okay. So um, who among you, have, have any of you played Little League when, when you were kids? Absolutely. Yes. Yep. Okay. Yes. How about you, all three of you did. Okay, <laughs> great. So this is really good because now, now I can ask a question that I'm really interested in. And the question is very simple. The question is, why are you involved in Hopkinson Little League? So what I'm really interested in is not only what is your personal experiences with the game, but also what, you, what nourishes you and... Um, brings you to this game as an adult to still stay, uh, stay involved with it. I'd like to hear from all of you, if you don't mind. Uh, sure, okay, I'll go first. Uh, for me, um, you know, I, I had the luxury of having some great coaches um, growing up and you know, played the game for a while. And for me, it's, it's about giving back and it's about representing uh, the models that I saw growing up as, as a as a kid, the role models and um, using, uh, you know, their best practices to, you know, teach not just aspects of the game, but um, life lessons. I think there's, I truly believe there's a lot of life lessons that uh, our volunteers are coaching our kids on a daily basis. Um, and to me, that's, you know, kind of bigger than just introducing uh, kids to the game itself. Um, I think in terms of 
what what keeps me motivated what keeps me uh coming back to do this um it's a whole range of things but it's primarily focused on you know when i see kids just smiling um after they do something that they weren't able to accomplish earlier in the season or you know just wanting to play a half an hour after their practice is done or um something i miss because i'm not able to kind of roam the halls of the schools that my kids go to um yeah, your kids, the, the kids that we coach, the kids that we that see us on a day-to-day -day basis recognize us. And, um, uh, you know, they, they see us uh, in, in the light as a coach, as a mentor, as someone who's helping them, you know, with the game itself and, and learning life lessons. So I think to me, that's, that's what I get out of it. Okay. All right. Very good. I'm going to follow up with that. Uh, Claire, what do you think? Well, I started um, playing softball when I was just at the end of the youth uh, age group. I was 12 when I started playing. And um, it, it was the first in my family to ever play a sport. And I found it such an enriching experience. I made so many friends, um, not only that year, but continuing to play on through high school and a little bit in college. And I really cherished those friendships. And then as an adult, once I started having kids, I really wanted them to have that same feeling of belonging and being part of a team and all those life lessons that you get from being on a team, uh, just working together for a common goal and um, you know, learning from the coaches and taking direction. And um, it's just been really fulfilling for me to see my kids grow through the program. Two of them have aged out and I still have my youngest playing in it. And I just really enjoy uh, seeing all the kids come together over the course of the season. You know, they may not know each other at the start of the season on their team. And then as the season goes on, you can just see that team start to gel and really enjoy playing with one another until it all culminates at the end and they've improved in their skills and they're having fun together. And it's just been so fulfilling for me to see that from my own kids mirroring the experience that I had as a youth. And I just wanted to give back um, to the program that has made that all possible for our family. Really good. Thank you, Claire. How about you, Georgia? Yeah, I'll, I'll just echo what Jeff and Claire said in terms of the skill building that we, we don't really think about. We, we're not so conscious of it, but it's actually absolutely happening um, for kids when they're playing team sports and, and things like building confidence, building relationship skills, uh, communication skills. These are all like incredible assets that come out of the opportunity for uh, team play, et cetera. So, uh, so I think that, you know, that's, that's something that all of us value who are on the board and who are coaching. Um, for me personally, my dad was a baseball coach. And so I was playing, you know, from day one. And it wasn't until probably about fourth grade when I actually landed on an official, you know, an official softball team and then uh, played almost with that same group of kids right on up through high school and it was that was an incredible experience in terms of the relationships and friendships that we built etc um, so i've been coaching probably at this point for about 38 years i think and uh, i would say that the one thing for me personally um, as a coach what really keeps me uh, so uh, enthused and interested is i walked into a supermarket probably about five years ago and the young woman behind the deli counter um, recognized me and you know I started to look and I mean it had been probably about 15 years since I had coached her etc and uh, she started talking about what a great time and what she appreciated from softball and I was like that's that's all you need to hear you know 20 years later yeah. um, when you have been a coach and to know that it made a difference um for some young person. So, so I think that's, you know, that those kind of experiences, both for kids and as coaches, that's what we really value as an organization. And um, I mean, it's, it's a heck of a lot of fun to watch baseball and softball, but there's something, there's another layer um, that goes on that's really special and really valuable. And that that's what keeps us enthused. Right. Now, if somebody started at the earliest age, they could start how many years of softball, or Little League, could they get in? So our, our T-ball program starts around five years old. Um, so if you start there, uh, you could certainly go a good, you know, 12, 
well not well i, I mean five, our five to twelve yeah our up to 12 years old our our boys and girls age out there and then they get picked up really by playing with different sort of school teams okay. um and then there's other there's other um older youth leagues that kids can join but we go to about 12 years old okay so so that's a good that's, that's a good like, run there and not only is it a good run it's a really good age it's a really good um you know, five to 12 is when there's so much growing going on. Um, I find that, you know, kids at that age are just like soaking up the knowledge and, you know, and really open to that. And so that's why I just wanted to just follow up and say, um, I was hoping, and I kind of suspected that the answer to my question was going to be exactly what you said. You know, I've seen enough movies um, that are centered on sports where you can see the most valuable element of sports is actually not the sport. It's the relationships that you build. It's the lessons that the youth are learning as they grow in this. And I am fascinated by that. And I just really, really, I love that. That's like my favorite thing. So, um, so I was wondering um, from there, just out of curiosity, how do how are things going in general? And I'm talking about like like when kids don't win, you know, and it's really hard and it's really heartbreaking, and and you have to coach, you have to kind of coach them through that. Um, that's what we have frozen that, yogurt and ice cream for, that's right? right? <laughs> <laughs> that's, why, that's why we have those places in town. Yeah. yeah. So is it like is it like when you were kids? You know, are times different? Are kids different? Or are, are you know, are the skills and the lessons uh, and the learning just the same? I'll take a stab at it. Um, so I, I think, you know, the the core uh, things in terms of the challenge of, of loss is kind of the same for, from, you know, when I played and, and when I look at these kids, I think that, um, you know, the, the pressure on some of these kids could be high. Um, it's, it's a mentally, it's a mental game and it puts uh, kids in sometimes unnatural um, spotlights. You know, you're up to bat, you're, you're a pitcher um, or you're making a key play. And I think what's important as coaches, and, and we work on this with our volunteers, um, we use a program called uh, the Positive uh, Coach Alliance. We've done uh, you know, some formal training around that for the last couple of years. And in a sense, what that embodies is um, how, do you, how do you help coach or teach your players um, to fail gracefully? How do you teach them to bounce back? Um, how do you turn their focus away from the failure uh, more towards things that they did correctly? Um, there's always something that you can find that they did well, um, even if the outcome is not what they thought. And I think that's really what we try to gravitate to um, and certainly what we want to see out of our, of our coaches um, you know, and their players. We, we have a pretty high uh, sportsmanship threshold, I would say, in Hopkinton. And we, as Jeff was saying, we really talk a lot with our adult um, coaches about really valuing sportsmanship and, and, and putting that first. And so it means that winning is not, is not the, the ultimate goal of what we're really working towards. And we're, we're really working towards skill improvement, personal improvement, um, and, and giving our best in a situation at any time, you know, trying to teach life lessons as part of what we do for baseball and softball. And so I, I think it's usually us as adults who bring more of the uh, sentiment, you know, we have to check ourselves, you know, that sentiment around wanting to win a game, um, et cetera. I mean, uh, you, on any given day, you can find kids sometimes a lot more relaxed than their coaches <laughs> you know, around um, what's going on in a game, et cetera. So sometimes we're learning from the kids too, but I think we have a pretty, a pretty uh, high threshold of really valuing sportsmanship in Hopkinton. And in fact, I think other towns are very respectful of our program in Hopkinton because of that too. Yeah. Yeah. And how are the parents? Um, do you find that you have to like work with parents and coach with parents that they also have, you know, uh, large investments in 
uh, winning or um, do you have like things that you do with them to make sure that they are learning and encouraging the same values that you're trying to teach out there on the field? Claire, you could talk a little yeah. bit about our survey here. And, yeah, why don't you start with you that? Know, feedback, chime in, yeah, et cetera. That's a good idea. Uh, yeah, so um, this year we uh, commissioned a survey to see how our parents were feeling about the game and our program and how we were doing and, and making sure that we are living up to our core values of sportsmanship and, um, you know, terms of player experience and making sure that the kids are having fun because that's really our number one goal is that the kids are having fun and um and learning and growing and you know hopefully picking up some baseball and softball skills along the way but that's not really the primary focus and um you know we surveyed our parents who kids played last year we asked them you know how did did we make that goal did we live up to that goal and the overwhelming majority said yes um, and um, I think we're most proud of that, even uh, last year being a weird COVID season, um, the fact that we met those goals and that kids had fun and um, were able to get outside and enjoy the sunshine and the summer weather. Um, we're really, really proud of that. And I think, um, you know, we set our expectations for sportsmanship right from the get-go. When you register, um, there is uh, something that you read and, and agree to that says, um, you know, that you understand what our sportsmanship standards are and that you agree to it. And again, when we start the season, we ask all those parents to read that again and sign it again and talk to their children about it so that everybody's on the same page and everybody's uh, aware of the expectations so that um, we don't have any issues when the season starts. Yeah, and to add on to that, we ask our coaches in their first meeting with their teams to, to also walk through that with their players and, and really um, embody that in, in a lot of the work that they do with their teams. Um, you know, and as, as things come up in the context of, of a practice or a game, you know, tackle those, um, you know, effectively to, to uh, you know, the expectations of our code of conduct. Great. All right. Uh, at this point, we got a question um, that somebody sent in. Um, do you expect any limitations or changes due to COVID nineteen? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a it's a great question. Thanks for thanks for that question. I, I so a few things. Um, I think we're gonna um, see some of the things we practiced last season still be in effect for this season. Um, I'm going to continue to work with uh, Sean at uh, the Department of Health, you know, to make sure that we're, um, you know, properly taking, you know, all the right precautions uh, to uh, not only what what his uh, department comes up with, but also the states and and CDC and, and even Little League International, and that's been our uh, mode um, going back to last year. Um, so we'll continue to do that as things adjust. Um, we'll obviously adjust with that. Um, and, you know, just a quick shout out to, to Sean and his department. They were a tremendous help in um, uh, making the season a reality last year. And so um, looking forward to uh, continuing that. And, and uh, as things change, we'll change accordingly. So what does, what does Little League in a pandemic look like? Is it just masks or... Uh, and sanitizer all over the place or do you do any other any other protocols yeah uh so we had um created a, a COVID-19 plan uh that's on our website um and to run through a couple of quick things we we had things from sanitizer in all our coaches bags to wiping down uh high touch areas on our fields uh to literally marking um areas that each player could stand in to maintain social distance um, to intake forms uh, for you know, players that walk on the field. Um, in terms of mask usage, uh, all of our coaches uh, mandatory had to wear them. All of our umpires mandatory had to wear them. Uh, we asked all the parents to wear them as well when they're on the fields. Uh, players had to wear them in certain conditions. For example, uh, if they reached on base uh, or similar kind of close contact situations, they were asked to wear them. And of course, 
uh, player families could, could have their player wear it all the time. You know, that was fine too. We also, we also did a massive uh, job to reschedule games and spread them out so kids were arriving. I mean, normally if you came to EMC Field on any given Saturday or Sunday during the spring, you, you might not get a parking spot. Um, you know, it's so busy with teams coming in, teams coming out, et cetera. So we rearranged the whole schedule using all the available fields in town so that teams were arriving with blocks of time in between. And it really was, um, I think it was a Herculean effort that happened um, with the help of the health department to run a really safe and productive uh, spring season last year. So, I mean, everything went so smoothly and, um, you know, really was a great job by, by all involved. I was just gonna add that um, in terms of the gameplay, one of the biggest differences was the umpire instead of standing behind the plate was standing behind the pitcher calling the balls and strikes from the completely opposite vantage point that they were trained to do. Wow. So, yes. How did that go? Did they really struggle with that? I think, our, they... I think our pitchers thought it, that, that some of the balls weren't as accurate as they, <laughs> they had seen it actually behind the plate. <laughs> yeah, you know, all things considered, um, you know, one of our longstanding volunteers, uh, our director of umpiring, you know, did a great job pulling aside his his umps for for the season and educating them on, you know, how to handle that situation. Because there's nothing in an umpire rule book that talks about that scenario. I mean, it's, it's just not something that's been done before. And so, um, you know, I thought they did a great job. They worked on how to position themselves uh, with respect to plays at third versus plays at first. Um, and there's there's been some learning along the way from. Uh, other um, umpire organizations that have since then provided some input on how to handle that more and, and educate, you know, umpires um, if we have to continue down this mode. Mm -hmm. So uh, what Georgia said made me made me think of something. I'm wondering. So you talked about all the fields around town. Do you also travel to other towns too? We do during the summer. So when we um, when we engage in summer league, and this is both for softball and baseball, you might be moving around to many of the local towns. There's a number of tournaments that we play in, and these are tournaments that extend over a period of time, but they might happen in one location. So for instance, we send a bunch of teams to Medway to play in uh, what's called the Torndorf tournament. We host a tournament here called Sizzler in Hopkinton, so we have, so it's great for us, but we have all these other towns who come to play in Hopkinton over the course of the summer. And then for softball, there is a, one league in particular that we participate in, which is called Twin Valley, which includes teams in Holliston and Medfield, um, could be Grafton, um, you know, a number of other local yeah. towns, Upton, et cetera. So, so those kids will be traveling also. Some of the games are home here in Hopkinton, but they'll also be on the road. Okay, and um, how how do you do that? <laughs> do you do you hire buses? No, uh, you know, like other uh, travel sports, um, you know, the parents, uh, you know, bring their players uh, to to the venue, and uh, you know, it's as simple as that. A lot of yeah. carpooling. A lot of carpooling too. Sometimes, of course, in today's world, maybe a little less so, but uh, <laughs> nonetheless, the parents are getting them there. <laughs> okay and it's, that's so, a nice you know jim that's a nice experience for the kids too because yeah. you meet kids from other towns and it's not always adversary in terms of you know you know that's your opponent but there are many kids who have gotten to know kids from other towns through participation in hopkinton little league um, baseball and softball because they've they've met these kids now for as many as you know, four or five seasons in a row playing in summer ball with, with and maybe fairly competitive games. And so they, they end up developing friendships, which mm -hmm. is a, a, another sort of just great add on to the softball baseball experience that you develop these friends in, in other towns. And what big thing you have in common is this love of your sport. And you might, they might end up going, all going on high school teams at some point. So they continue to see themselves um, on fields together, et cetera. So it's a really nice feature uh, in particular about the opportunities to play during the summer. Yes, that to me is, is one of the really amazing things about sports. When you hear stories of, you know, how 
how kids who are in competition um, overcome that when you know there there is a need. Um, you know, you hear stories all the time. I, I remember one story I really love. I don't know if you heard about it. It was last year, so it wasn't little league, but it was um, this team showed up. And only one cheerleader showed up because the rest of the, her, her squad had been sick. So these cheerleaders from the other team came over and did <laughs> cheers for them. So that like was really awesome. great. Yeah. <laughs> now, um, <clears throat> I don't know, you know, like uh, things are always growing and things are changing. So could we just talk a little bit about um, softball versus a uh, little li baseball and um, what the differences are? Well, big difference is the size of the ball. <laughs> I mean, that's really, I mean, if you went piece by piece and feature by feature, there's a lot of things that are extremely similar about this, about the, you know, baseball and softball in terms of uh, the, the action in the field, et cetera. There are, there are some different um, dimensions in the field. There are some different rules around pitching, the delivery of pitch is probably one of the biggest differences. And that is that, it, that it's still an underhand pitch in softball, but uh, you get a, a really strong underhand pitch in softball and that ball can, can, can come in at 50 miles an hour just as, as much as the baseball would. So, um, so there are d definitely some uh, fundamental differences about the sport, but in terms of the strategy and the base running and the the uh, you know interest in trying to hit it over the fence and things like that they're very similar uh, really they're identical actions and things that happen between baseball and softball I mean I, I think I think that there are some and and Claire uh, and Jeff you can talk to this too but there are some differences in I don't know in uh, the way softball the way a team in softball functions versus perhaps the way a team in baseball functions. And I've coached both baseball and softball. And so some of those differences are gender related um, and they can, you know, they can be different experiences. There, there are things perhaps sometimes that girls place value on that might be different than things that boys place value on who are the same age. Um, but they're, they're both, uh, rewarding experiences. And we actually do have some girls who cross over uh, to play baseball um, too. We've had a few over the years. Um, so I, I, I honestly, I think the biggest difference is the size of the ball and the delivery of the pitch. <laughs> yeah, I think, you know, outside of what Georgia mentioned, uh, you know, one cool uh, similarity is, you know, the level of play is, is I think at the, at our older age groups, uh, phenomenal. Um, between both and where we're able to showcase that is a, is a fun event called the home run derby um, that we have. And um, I have three kids. Uh, my youngest is, is uh, uh, my daughter. And uh, I was able to bring her to one of the home run derbies for softball. And, and she was enamored by uh, just the level and, and number of home runs that these girls are hitting over, over the fence. It's, it's just incredible to watch and uh, very inspiring. Uh, to a young player to, to see that it's pretty cool Jim you know I just want to add to what Jeff's saying in that we we have had some high school baseball and softball teams I mean really just consistent top uh tri-valley uh teams and that's a testament really to I think to the the strength of the program in the town and that, uh, again, all the things we've been talking about in terms of valuing sportsmanship, really focused on skill building, uh, creating opportunities for, for team building and friendships, relationships, et cetera. Those, are, those things have, for a number of years now, translated, I think, into some really special teams at the high school level. And I think, that, and those are kids who have come up through the program. I mean, you can... You could interview one baseball and one softball player after another, and I think they would tell you about their experiences in Hopkins and Little League. So, um, you know, we look at it really as a, a full picture that we're starting with those kids at five and trying to teach a love of the sport and skill build. And hopefully by the time, if they remain interested, uh, that by the time they get to high school, um, we're, we're creating some real phenomenal players. And, and if they're not interested in playing anymore, they have at least come away with a real appreciation and understanding of the game of softball or baseball. Right. So question, 
Is it harder to hit a home run in soft, uh, or like over the field? Yes, over the field absolutely. Softball. softball. Yes. yes. Yeah, I would agree with that. <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking just the physics of it, you know? Yes, that it, ball's a lot bigger. <laughs> yeah, it's a lot bigger. Absolutely. And it's softer, so it absorbs some of the energy. Yeah, yeah. that's what I thought. All right. My old softball coach used to call baseballs marbles. He said, you hit that marble. <laughs> so much easier. Baseball yards. so much easier. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So let's, let's talk. Why are we talking about softball and baseball in January when there's snow on the ground and it's going to be 20 degrees out tomorrow? Why are we talking about your sport now? Well, you know, spring will come, the snow will melt, and we're getting ready. And uh, if, if uh, your son or daughter is interested in playing baseball or softball, now is the time to sign up. Um, our registration is closing very soon. Um, it's been open since November, and we're closing it on Sunday, January 31st. And um, we really want people to go ahead and sign up right now. Um, don't wait until the last minute. Um, so that we can get going, you know, we're, we're still planning a season in COVID-19 mm -hmm. aspects. And, you know, the more time that we have to get our teams and players ready to go, um, the better. But, um, you know, again, you know, you, you know anybody in kindergarten, um, you know, we're starting at age five uh, with co-ed t-ball, boys and girls together. Um, you know, it's a great place to start. Uh, no prior skill required. Um, just come out and play and enjoy uh, something new. Um, you know, we really hope that um, if anybody has any questions, they can reach out. Um, they can reach out to either through our website or um, HopkinsonLittleLeague at gmail.com. And those emails will come to me. And so now you all know me and I'm you know, friendly face here on the other side and I'll get back to you as soon as I can. And if it's a question I can't answer, I'll make sure that I get somebody in touch with you who can answer. Okay. So you said Hopkinson Little League at gmail.com. That's and right. The website? Uh, HopkinsonLittleLeague.org. Okay. So four days left of, of the um, availability to sign up for it. So um, that's really important. Now, um, one thing I didn't I just uh, wanted to get to is there a lot of injuries? It's like, what do you do to help? Um, you know, I mean, you're, you're talking about sports. You're talking about fast moving um, pieces of wood or aluminum and balls. And um, you know, uh, do you have training? Do you what? What? How do you handle the potential for injuries? Yeah, great question. Um, so Little League International, um, it, one of the things that all leagues are have to do um, each year is provide safety training to their volunteers. Um, so I, I'm, thank you for asking that because I don't think a lot of people know that. Um, every, every year we bring all of our coaches, um, all of our board members, anyone that's going to be on the field, and we walk them through a series of safety training. We actually have one of the EMTs from Hopkinton come in um, and also walk us through basic first aid, um, you know, basic CPR, uh, et cetera. From a sports point of view, um, you know, we take uh, certain precautions depending on, on the age to, in terms of certain equipment that we use. Um, you know, for instance, at the lower levels, we use a, 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 a softer uh, baseball, for example, a softer softball. Um, uh, we also encourage coaches to use different training aids that, that um, offer different safety as well. Um, face masks, um, you know, in softball are getting used more. Um, and so there's, there's many others that I'm sure I'm missing. I know Georgia will be quick to chime in, but yeah, we, we definitely take uh, safety as a top priority. Um, we actually have a board member whose sole responsibility is to coordinate safety, to work with players and their families if there's a player injury. Um, and uh, each time that happens, we outreach to that family to make sure that that player is okay. Um, and, and to make sure that, you know, we know when they can come on and, and safely play again if they're able to that season. This is the other thing we do is we are cognizant of overuse injuries. So we have uh, 
pitching limitations in place where um, you know, a pitcher can only pitch a certain number of pitches in a given day and then has to have a certain number of days of rest in order to make sure that their arms are, are taken care of. And you know, coaches also help to teach uh, players you know, how to take care of their arms, how to stretch them, how to warm up properly. Um, I'm sure Georgia can explain a lot more about that than I can. But that, that, that's a really good point that Claire is making, that there is a, an accountability system towards the health of our players. And, and it's very focused on pitching. But, um, you know, it's, it's a conversation that we have with coaches and, and we have an accountability system where coaches are reporting in data in order for us to make sure that we're taking care of our, our players' health. So, so it's important. And uh, we put a lot of value on it as a board. Great. Um, another question out of left field, as they say. Very good. Um, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh, several years ago, soccer became a craze. And the one thing that I noticed was that soccer seemed to be all the time, like it was practices all the time. I'm just wondering, did that have an effect on, um, on your sport? And is it, a, is it a continuing effect or how, how does that happen? Um, I can't, uh, I mean, I'll, I'll tackle it on, and you guys can jump in. Um, I, I think there's been some impact, but if you're talking about our, our practices, we don't, we don't practice that often. We have uh, one practice, um, you know, per week uh, time adjusts based on, you know, age of the group. Um, you know, I, I think like any other sport happening right now, baseball can be a, a full, uh, you know, year round sport. Um, many of our players play in, uh, you know, other travel leagues um, and they're practicing in the off season, playing at the same time we're playing. Um, and I think there's just so many opportunities, which is a good thing uh, for, uh, you know, our kids uh, to play different sports. So I think it, it, it's based on choice of what the player wants to play. Um, and, you know, the opportunities and whether they want to make it, you know, one season or all year, um, and, you know, kind of cuts both ways. Yeah, Jim, mm -hmm. I, I think that we, you know, as a, as a board, it, our ultimate goal is to see every youth in Hopkinton involved yep. in something. And so whether it's soccer, lacrosse or baseball, softball, basketball, et cetera, um, you know, we're, we don't see ourselves as competing against those other sports. Yeah. Uh, most of our kids play those different sports also. And we might have we might have played those sports. So I, I, I coach soccer when my kids were in soccer. And so um, we value all of those experiences. And we work very closely with board members on those other organizations so that when we do have kids who might play multiple sports, we do what we can to rearrange conflicts. the schedule so that yeah. kids don't have as many conflicts as they might if we weren't working together. So we really, we really do try and work with the other um, sports organizations in town to uh, make it as easy as possible for kids who do want to do multiple sports. But ultimately, we're just happy to see kids involved, being physically active, you know, getting them minutes of vigorous activity, et cetera. So, um, yeah, so it's not, it's not, not, it's not a problem. It's, um, you know, it's just something that, that we try and work collaboratively around. Okay. Claire, did you want to add something? Uh, yeah, Georgia has touched on it, just that uh, how we work with the other organizations in order to adjust our schedules. Like just this week, I had a soccer reach out to me, say, hey, what is, what is your softball game schedule looking like? And, you know, and we work together to make sure that, at least in terms of games, that we're, we're not conflicting <laughs> game times for a certain age group. The practices, mm -hmm. it gets a little tougher, um, but you know, if, if somebody tells us, okay, my, my child is playing soccer, they have practices on Thursdays at 6 p.m., then um, if they let us know, then we can try to make sure that they get on a team that doesn't have practices on Thursday at 6 p.m. So, you know, like we really try to make sure that if, if kids want to play both soccer and baseball um, or lacrosse and softball, um, that that opportunity is available to them. They don't have to choose. Great. All right. So um, our time is beginning to run short. And there are two questions. One is mine and one came in um, that I'm going to ask you. But I'm going to tell you what my question is first. Okay. 
And then I'm going to ask the question that came in to give you time to think about it. My final question for you is, at what it, can, can you give me um, an example of why, uh, of why you love what you do? It could be a specific event that happened at a game or during coaching that really touched you and like really exemplifies why you do, or it may just be a general, you know, like every year we have a tradition and we do this or something like that. What's your favorite part about the Hopkins Little League? And while you think about that, the question that came in is, does every child that registers get to play? Yes. Um, so the answer is yes, uh, unequivocally. Um, and if there are families who uh, are challenged to be able to pay um, the, the registration fee, uh, they can reach out and, and we'll certainly work with them. Uh, we want, as Georgia mentioned, uh, as many players who want to play, play. Um, that's, that's why we're here. Excellent. Okay, so let's start with uh, Georgia. Georgia. Yeah, so uh, one of, the, one of uh, the things that I have done, especially when I have younger teams, it doesn't work so much with older teams, but when I've coached younger teams, one of my biggest joys is to really share the joy of a home run with kids. Um, because, you know, not every player is going to get that experience of hitting a home run in his or her lifetime. And you come home to home plate and everybody storms you, et cetera. So <laughs> we practice that, actually. So we do this little thing called a home run stomp. And we take turns. Uh, with the whole team waiting at home plate and you you hit a ball out there and you run around all the bases and when you get to home plate your entire team is waiting there for you jump all over you take you to the ground tap you on your helmet you know the whole thing and uh, it's for me one of the most joyful moments in in coaching younger teams great thank you Georgia that's great Claire what do you got um there's something that some uh, teams do after their game you call a, a relay race where they have um, both teams um, will line up one team at home plate and the other team at second base and uh, you say go and they all start running around the bases and, and running as fast as they can and um, whoever gets all the, their players around the bases all at once uh, wins and like the excitement on the kids faces like because I don't know how it happens but it always ends up being like a tie like within a split second and to them they've all won and they're so excited jumping up and down and the smiles on their faces it's just incredible it's one of my favorite things to watch beautiful thank you claire jeff yeah i'd say uh one example is you know this has happened to a few of my teams you know the a player you know, towards the end of the season as we're you know kind of wrapping things up finally gets their first hit and uh, one of the cool things about, you know, trying to pull a team together is, you know, getting them to think as one unit, getting them to think as one team, you know, kind of one family. And when that player gets that, that first hit of the season and to have their teammates come out or in the dugout, give them high fives and cheer them and say, hey, great job. Um, that means more to them coming from their teammates than it does from their coach. And, and right. it's an awesome experience for those kids. Okay, that's a great way to bring us home. That's uh, wonderful. Thank you all for the work that you do for the youth in our community and uh, for coming on the show and sharing uh, your passion with us. Thank you. Really appreciate you. your time and the opportunity. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. All right. all right. So thank you for watching. And if you're interested, HopkintonLittleLeague.org or HopkintonLittleLeague at gmail.com. And uh, I hope that you... Um, get involved because they sound like a great organization. Take care, everybody, and have a great night. And we will see you next time on the Hangout Hour. <laughs>